Thanks for having us here this evening. I'm Kurt Schaefer. I'm the Senate candidate for the 19th Senate District. I'm a lawyer in private practice. I'm a former Assistant Attorney General, former Special Prosecutor for the State of Missouri, a former Special Assistant U.S. Attorney. I prosecuted murderers, rapists, violent sexual offenders, child molesters, environmental polluters, prosecuted Medicaid fraud, broad spectrum of criminals in this state. It's a solid background to have to actually be in the Senate, to actually understand what crime is and what crime isn't. The other issue, um, I'm a former Deputy Director and General Counsel for the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I have lived in Columbia for 25 years. I'm a graduate of Kit Salter's Geography Department, an undergraduate from the University of Missouri. I live with my wife of 18 years Stacia, and we live in Columbia. We've got three small kids, two in the Columbia Public School System. system. One of them is a little bit too small to be in school yet. And I'm running for this Senate because we can do better. And whether it's my background of negotiating billions of dollars of sewer and water infrastructure improvements in St. Louis and Kansas City, prosecuting murderers, prosecuting anyone who violates the law and thinks they can get away with it, which is absolutely unacceptable, working to protect our environment. My time up? Time's up. Uh, I'm talking away. Problem with a lawyer, I talk too much. Anyway, I'm Kurt Schaefer. I'm running for the 19th Senate. How are you doing? My name is Christopher DeWire. Um, one minute. Thanks for coming here. Um, just so you have an idea of who I am. Um, a father, husband, farmer, stay-at-home dad, a businessman, a uh, veteran, a disabled veteran. Um, I can keep going on. I, I am a, a part-time employee, and I am also a, uh, last but not least, an American. And with that being said, I think that will cover my minute. Thank you. Good evening and thanks for coming out. I'm uh, Chuck Graham, I'm the current state senator, uh, running for re-election as a Democrat, and it's good to see so many friends here in Southern Boone County. Uh, I've represented you either in the House or in the Senate for the last 12 years, and uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure uh, to make so many friends in Southern Boone County and to work on the issues uh, that you care about, whether it's working on large uh, infrastructure issues, uh, like a regional sewer district, or uh, passing legislation to allow uh, Pierpont to use county uh, zoning and regulation or getting the Katy Trail raised to protect Hartsburg from flooding. Uh, issues large and small, I've been happy to work with you. Uh, constituent services are a large part of this job and it's something I'm very proud of the work that I've done in this area and look forward to the questions this evening. The first question <coughs> comes from Maria. The University of Missouri is often called the economic engine of Boone County. How can we get uh, more, more funding provided to the university for research which creates economic development. I'll go first with Mr. Dwyer on that and Mr. Schaefer. Okay. Um, on the university funding, uh, to be honest with you, I, this is not one of my strong topics. I can't speak to that issue. The only thing that I can tell you is if elected, I'd get down there, find people who are knowledgeable about the university, what the university's needs are, and, and, and work to fulfill those needs. I would also um, work with Contact the University. They, I believe they will have a, a um, seminar for newly elected um, representatives and state centers, and uh, they will let you know what their needs and what their wants are and, and how they think they'll, you should go about achieving those, um, those goals. Thank you. Thank you. I am a graduate of the University of Missouri. I'm a member of the Alumni Association, <coughs> and it is the largest economic engine for this district. There's no doubt about it. I support stem cell research. My sister is the deputy director of the Hope Center for Neurological Disorders at Washington University. She's a lawyer and a molecular biologist. And I talk to her all the time about the amazing things that Washington University is doing, the stem cell research. And I, I, I tell everyone, that's what we need to be doing at the University of Missouri. That's the kind of research that we need to be doing to bring high-tech jobs to this, to this area, to provide the cures that we need, but when you look at the patch that we've had recently with the University of Missouri, keep in mind that throughout the history of this state, it has been a struggle to bring dollars to the University of Missouri because there are representatives and senators from the boot here and from Northwest Missouri and Northeast Missouri who want that money to go to their district. But throughout our history, we have always done a very good job of convincing those people that we are the flagship university in Columbia at the University of Missouri and that those dollars invested in the University of Missouri are investment in our future. 
And in the last four years, because of our representation in the Senate, we have lost that position. Again, it's been a struggle since the beginning of this state to get that money to come to us, but it's always worked out. But you have to ask yourself, why aren't we getting that now? And the reason is because we need professionalism. We need somebody who can negotiate. We need somebody who is a moderate, like I am, who can reach across party lines and persuade people of what the importance of the University of Missouri is. Not simply draw ultimatums, say it's my way or the highway, and you get stuck with the highway. For example, when we lost an $85 million health sciences center at the University of Missouri two years ago. We simply can never endure that again, and we can never allow it to happen. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're absolutely right that the uh, University of Missouri is the economic engine uh, that not only drives mid-Missouri, but uh, a whole lot of the state of Missouri. Uh, if you take a look at where jobs grow now, they cluster around uh, areas of higher education. And we have a multitude of those in our district, whether it's the University of Missouri, uh, Stevens College, Columbia College, or Mobile Area Community College. Uh, as we invest in those institutions, we're going to grow jobs. The big problem that we've had over the last four years is regionalism. We have a governor from Springfield, and I'll tell you at this point, I'm ready to vote against any governor on bipartisan basis is from Springfield because they think regionally, and all they want to do is support Southwest Missouri. We need people who understand in the governor's office, and I think Jay Nixon understands that, that we need to invest in the University of Missouri. We need to bring those research dollars here. But you can't bring those researchers here if you cave in on issues like stem cell research, which the people of this district, of this state, put into our state constitution, and the Republicans in the legislature try to put conditions on this university that restricted academic freedom and restricted stem cell research, which we're doing two of those projects right now on campus. We can't allow that to happen, because if you do that, then they're gonna start dictating the entire university curriculum in legislation. That's a dangerous precedent for us to set. I'm glad we were able to not end up with those restrictions, still get the $31 million for Ellis Michelle, and not have to uh, have that wall that would block people from wanting to move to our state, bringing their NIH grants to our state, because I can tell you they were ready to go somewhere else when they thought that this university was gonna cave in to the right-wing agenda that's been going on in Jefferson City. Thank you. Next question. The state of Missouri has heavily invested in ethanol, assisted building ethanol plants, um, and, and we have mandates as to percentage of ethanol in our gasoline. How's that going in your point of view, and should that continue? Mr. Grand, then Mr. Dwyer, and then Mr. Schiff. Thank you. Um, I voted for that bill. Uh, I think that at this point, um, in our energy supply, ethanol is an important part of that. Um, I think that, however, that being said, it's a bridge field. Uh, I think that we need to invest, especially on a federal level, uh, much more uh, of our federal dollars into energy research and moving us away from fossil fuels, especially in terms of our vehicles. Uh, but between now and then, we've got to get from here to there. And ethanol is an important component of that. I realize it's controversial. Not everybody supports uh, the 10% mandate. But to be able to make it economically viable, we had to make it a mandate. And uh, we'll see how that goes. It's certainly something that if it's not working out over time, uh, the legislature should come back and revisit it. Uh, but at this time, I think it's a policy that's going to help us get from here to there until we have uh, cars that run uh, on flex fuel or uh, hopefully uh, on electricity or some other battery project that hopefully uh, we have a university researcher that patents it, uses our uh, new uh, small business development center that we're building at the University of Missouri to help us transition those things through our small business incubator and grow companies and jobs out of it. It'd be great if they were located right around the airport, which I think is in Asheville these days, except for the airport. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, as a farmer, uh, as a farmer of livestock, I'm not too keen on the, the issue of ethanol. Um, Especially when we start making uh, ethanol from uh, from corn, you know, as a farmer, like I said, I raise cattle, I raise pigs, I raise chickens, and sheep. And me personally, I'd rather be feeding my animals the corn than feeding the, my truck that corn. Once again, I don't necessarily have a problem with the ethanol, but what I have a problem with is the mandated 
ethanol. I think if this ethanol product is such a great product, it should be able to stand on its own. And we as a consumer should be able to decide we want to use it or we don't want to use it. And I, I think that's enough there. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I, I support ethanol for now. I think it needs a sunset on it. I think, I'm an environmental lawyer. I have a master's degree in environmental law. This is my law degree. Most of my law practice is energy and environmental law. That's what I do. I've litigated uh, energy rate cases in the Public Service Commission. I don't know how many of them dealing with rate base and what it's fair to charge customers for building a new power plant. The issue of ethanol, I think, it, it, at this point, we, ha we have to look at stimulating new markets. And by having the mandate, we allow the money to be generated to provide an infrastructure for that new market. I certainly hope that technology catches up, which it's doing very quickly, so we can, we can switch from a corn-based ethanol to a switchgrass-based based ethanol or some other cellulosic material that's not a food source. I think if we get to that, it'll be sustainable on its own. I don't think it should be perpetual. I think it should have a five to seven year sunset. I think when we review that, if it's determined that it's not economically viable, it's not the right thing to be doing, then we need to stop the mandate. Third question, the 2005 cuts of taxpayer-supported health care services were alternately called immoral and necessary, depending on often which political party you belong to. What's the next step in state-funded health care? We'll go to the next question. Okay. We have two minutes, is it? Two minutes, okay. First of all, there's no doubt that in 2005 when those cuts were made, Medicaid in the state was heading for bankruptcy. Everybody knew it, and the question is, why was it allowed to ever get to that point? The other thing that we've got is in 2005, only 70% of the people who were on Medicaid were ever checked for their eligibility. And in 2005, it was, after that, it was 100% checked for eligibility. And there were hundreds of thousands of people who were found that, had, that should no longer have been on Medicaid, but were stealing Medicaid dollars from those that should have been on Medicaid. Again, it was very, very poorly run and very inefficient. Now, one thing that the Democrats don't want to tell you and the Republicans don't want to tell you either is since 2005, the Medicaid rolls have gone up 20%. Democrats don't want to tell you that because they want to make it look so draconian and they have to reinstate all of the cuts that were made. I do not agree with reinstating all the cuts that were made. One in five Missourians on Medicaid, the fourth largest state per capita in the country on Medicaid spending, is absolutely unacceptable, and never it, this, this state never should have gotten to that point. Do we need to constantly be reevaluating re eligibility criteria to make sure that those people that need those services get those services? Absolutely. <coughs> That's where we're working to now. Are there bumps in the road? Yes. Were the cuts draconian? They were. The system was in a very bad place, though. And I'm hoping that as we continue to redefine eligibility criteria and reevaluating who needs those benefits and who's been getting them that shouldn't have been getting them. And again, I think I'm the only person, maybe even in this room, who's actually prosecuted Medicaid fraud and seen it firsthand and seen how those dollars are stolen from people who need that money. We're working towards that, but it's going to take a little bit more time. I know people don't want it to take more time, but it's a very complicated problem, but I think we're getting to a better place. Thank you. Mr. Green? I oppose those cuts. They went too far. They were done the wrong way. You know, if you take a look at the way they did the cuts, they would buy somebody with a severe disability a power wheelchair, but they wouldn't buy them a battery. Now, what makes sense about that? They cut what they considered optional services. Oxygen was considered optional. What's optional about oxygen? These were done wrong, and I think they were done by people who didn't understand the people that we were serving. <coughs> and we've got to do a better job. And there are ways to pay for it. I'm glad that Kirk has prosecuted Medicaid fraud. The question you have to ask is why is there still half a billion dollars of Medicaid fraud in this state? Half a billion dollars. If we had just half of that, we could match the federal dollars that have gone back to Washington and gone out to Massachusetts and Illinois and Kansas and other states that are expanding health care coverage. We could just recover half of that. We could restore all the cuts to the people who've lost their health care. And you've got to ask the second question. What happens if we don't get this federal insurance where the state pays 17 cents on the dollar to get it? They end up at the university hospital with 100% uncompensated care, where the taxpayer picks up 100% of the bill. And instead of going to the local clinic, 
and getting lower cost health care, we get the highest cost health care because everybody has a right to an emergency room. And that gets very expensive and it's something we can't afford. It's like the old Fram oil filter commercial. You can pay us now or you can pay us later. Right now, the later bill is going to be a lot more expensive than you can ever imagine. Thank you. Um, on the Med Medicare, Medicaid cuts, um, I really don't know much about it other than to say, without actually getting down there and seeing what's going on, um, I really couldn't say one way or another one that they were, that they were cut too much. I, I will say that we obviously cut some people off those programs that did need it, as Chuck said, people who were, you know, we'd buy them a wheelchair but not supply them with a battery. Um, I think that's just, that's, that's kind of crazy, that's insane. Um, so without actually getting down there and seeing what's going on, I really shouldn't speak to this up here. Thank you. Last question. Come to our reader. Do you support providing tax breaks to little new business in Boone County? And I'll add to that, I'm figuring out the 30 seconds if you want. I'll add to that, if, if so, why? If not, what would you do to little new business to do to do that? New jobs. Uh, um, I'm not in favor of that. Um, you know, we had an opportunity like that not too long ago uh, here in Southern Boone County when a Dollar General was looking at coming in here. Uh, and they were going to bring 300 jobs at $8 an hour, and they wanted to have 20 years of their property taxes waived. Well, what's that going to do to your schools here in Nashville? They're going to bring all these families with all these kids, making $8 an hour, and we're going to lose the tax base for our educational system. It doesn't make much sense to me. The General Assembly has gotten out of control with some of the ideas that they have, whether it's offering $880 million to a French-Canadian uh, aircraft manufacturer to come here, or we had a developer in St. Louis who, through shell companies, bought up property all over North uh, City, St. Louis, knocked out the doors and the windows so they would deteriorate more rapidly, and then asked the state for $100 million. Matt Blunt called a special session to give them $100 million. I don't think that's a very good business plan, and I don't think we should be rewarding behavior like that. The way that you attract business, once again, is to invest in K-12 and invest in higher education. Jobs in the 21st century cluster around areas of higher education, where there's an educated <coughs> workforce. If we grow those jobs through the university, we do it through R&D, we take the patents and the bright ideas that can come up with the university, and we grow companies in this community, we are going to attract those folks and we're gonna have good schools, we're gonna have futures for our children, it's like giving away your seed corn when you take money from the schools in a, in a property tax giveaway to be able to bring in other companies and corporations for jobs. You know, that's not the way to succeed uh, in the 21st century. Thank you. Do we need to invest more in education, both K through 12 and the university? Absolutely. That's a key component to our economic development. Do we need to invest in health care? Yes, we do. But the side of the equation that you're not hearing is where is that money going to come from? And the, the, the side of that is we have to help stimulate economic development. Because we're not losing jobs in this state to China and India. We're losing jobs in this state to Indiana and Kentucky and Tennessee. Because they are providing a better economic environment for businesses to invest their capital. And I represent businesses all the time. In Columbia, we represent large businesses out on Route, route B, industrial business, small businesses downtown. And you know what? They may love a community. But they make their economic decisions for themselves and their shareholders based on what is the best investment for the company. They've got to look at what is the climate here, what's our future. And you have to be able to provide a solid economic climate. Chuck Graham voted against tort reform, he voted against uh, workers' comp reform, all those things that we've done to create a better opportunity here. As far as tax credits, I do agree with tax credits. You know, when companies come in and say, give me 20 years of, of, of tax-free uh, existence, or we're not going to come. You know, I've been involved in some pretty complex negotiations. And when people come in the door and say that, they're usually about half right. They're bluffing. You can get them down to a point where you can get a balance of giving them an incentive to come, but getting enough from the process that you are benefiting your community economically. And that's the kind of wise decision making, rather than knee-jerk reactions, that we need in the Senate, or we simply are going to keep losing jobs to Kentucky Tennessee, Indiana. 
We've got to provide economic incentives to grow our businesses, to give those businesses a reason to invest their capital right here. Otherwise, they're going to invest it somewhere else. But when they invest it here, that'll give us a better tax base. It'll give us the money for education. It'll give us the money for health care. Because without it, we're not going to get the money anywhere else. Mr. Dwyer. Thank you. I would say this is for my issue here. How many have kids? More than, more than one kid. I have two kids. I cut them a piece of pie. Do I give them both the same size pie? Of course. Because if I give one kid a smaller piece, he's going to complain. So, so tax incentives are a scam. We lose businesses because they go to Tennessee where they pay no state income tax. So why come to Missouri to locate here in Missouri and you're going to have to pay Missouri state income tax when I can locate my business in Tennessee and pay no state income tax. That's one way to grow your economy. Lower your state income tax to zero. Move it to a state sales tax because technically you're paying the tax. You just don't see it. It's hidden in the products. Every product, every service you consume, that tax is in there. And I think that's how you grow your economy here in the state of Missouri and the state income tax. Thank you. Be happy to. First of all, thanks again for having the forum. Got the shaky knees that Kathy was talking about here. Um, it's been a real pleasure uh, to represent you in one form or another uh, over the last 12 years. Uh, you know, four years ago, uh, when I got elected, uh, something changed in Jefferson City for the first time in 82 years. And that's that the other party had the governor's office, the House, and the Senate. And uh, to borrow from Ronald Reagan for a moment, are you better off four years? Are you better off now than you were four years ago? I don't feel like that we are. Uh, our unemployment rate is high, uh, highest it's been in a decade. Uh, we're losing jobs. The stock market's collapsing. We have a lot of problems that have arisen, and we need to change those things. I opposed a lot of these things because I saw what was coming. And sometimes I was the only one, not always. We're going to get new leadership in the governor's office with Jay Nixon this year. And I look forward to being a partner with Jay Nixon. And one thing that you can count on when you're there is I won't ever forget you. Happy to have my cell number, that's one reason. But I've got a brother that lives in Ashland. Uh, my treasurer, Joe Miller, uh, is a leading resident of Ashland. And I come from a small town. I come from Louisiana, Missouri, population 3,700. I know how important small issues are here that other people from Columbia or other areas may not. Uh, you know, when the Ashland police uh, didn't have childcare seats to pick up kids in situations of domestic violence, I got the highway patrol to give them to. Now, some people may ridicule that and say, well, that wasn't a big bill. You know what? It's pretty important to be flashy. It's pretty important to those kids that will get picked up in those situations. I'd be more than honored to continue that service if you give me an opportunity. We're getting in the silly season now, folks. And first of all, I didn't steal Lena Long's yard sign. <laughs> I know Lena and Carl, and I probably couldn't have gotten to it. But you know what? We don't believe in taking the yard signs or spray painting them or stealing them. And we don't believe in negative robocalls that come after 10 o'clock at night. We don't run campaigns like that. I come out here, I look in the eye, I deal with you directly. Most of the time we agree, we don't always agree. But the one thing that you can count on is I will take your call, I'll listen to your issues, and I'll do the best job that I can for you, and I'll never forget you. And thank you so much for being here this evening. Folks, I'll make it plain and simple. Let me tell you what I do. I don't believe that a senator who takes an oath to uphold the law, a senator on the Senate Judiciary Committee, who has taken an oath to reevaluate and constantly look at our court system, our judicial system, and make sure it's effective, that somebody who violates the law, causes a free car crash at twice the legal limit, and then lies in open court, and I'll show you the pleading right here, and says he didn't refuse the breathalyzer because he didn't want to have to enforce or follow through with the own law that he's required to. To, to carry out, losing his license for a year, he refuses to go on the breathalyzer. 
He lied in court and said he didn't refuse. He's on video six times at the Columbia Police Department refusing to blow on the breathalyzer, yet he files a lawsuit in court that says he didn't refuse. Someone who takes an oath to uphold the laws of this state and then blatantly violates them for their own benefit is absolutely intolerable to me as a prosecutor, as a father of three small children, and as a member of this community and a longtime resident of the community. And let's talk about some of those other issues. The University of Missouri suffered its worst budget cut ever in 2002 under the Democrats in the majority in a Democrat government. One hundred million dollars. That's the largest budget cut ever. And in the last four years, the budget has gone back up. One hundred million dollars. But you're not going to hear that. Again, what we need is moderation. We need people who know how to work across party lines and not simply throw political partisan bombs. We need somebody who respects the office of the state senate because we have lost all respect for that seat. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming here tonight. Um, I just like to say Kurt Schaefer's a good guy. Chuck Graham's a good guy. We're all three here up here for one reason. We think we can make the state better. I think that's up to you to decide who who you'd like to, to have as your leader. I'd really like to um, um, encourage you to go to my website at uh, Dwyer for Senate at lpmo.org, or you can send me an email at Dwyer for Senate at yahoo.com. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Like I said, both these guys are, are great guys. We all want to take the state to a better place. It's just a matter of which which one you want to follow. Thank you. Chris is a good guy too. <laughs> Thank you.